For all of us, it's about predicting where the consumer is going and getting half of it right. One of the things we want to do is create ads that don't suck. Embracing change creates great possibility. I'm Alan Hart, and this is Marketing Today. Today on the show, I've got Sterling Snow, Senior Vice President of Revenue at Divi. On the show today, we talk about the founding story of Divi and why it was created in the beginning. We also talk about marketing at a high growth company like Divi. And we uh, also talk about what the impact of building your own brand can be on your own company. So I hope you enjoy this conversation with Sterling Snow. Well, Sterling, welcome to the show. Appreciate it. Thanks for having me. Excited to have a chat. Yeah, no, I, and I, I should give a shout out to a listener, um, Ryan Hilliard. Uh, he's the director of marketing at Lifeomic. He actually suggested I, I talk to you. And I don't know if you know him or if he was just like, I really want to know, hear from the, the head of revenue at Divi. But uh, I do want to give Ryan a little shout out. So thank you, Ryan. Yeah, and I don't know Ryan, but I'm doubling the shout out because I'm uh, excited to chat with Alan. So all good. Yeah. We are at a crazy time right now. This episode won't launch for a few, a number of weeks, but <laughs> we're in total coronavirus work from home mode. You just had an earthquake in uh, Salt Lake. Uh, if, if I didn't know better, I think the world was coming to an end. Yeah, no kidding. But let's start with you a little bit and just where'd you grow up and, and what brought you to Salt Lake, Utah? Yeah. So I grew up in a small town in northern Nevada, uh, outside of the Reno Tahoe area. The actual name of the town is Winnemucca. Super small town, about 10,000 people. And that's where I lived and grew up and went to high school. And, and then when, uh, when it came time to go to college, I came into Utah. I played soccer and went to school for finance and then got into the startup scene uh, pretty quickly after that. And Started at a company called Jive and helped build the marketing team there. And then I exited that company. We got bought by LogMeIn. And at the same time, I met up with the Divi founders and decided it would be a hell of a time to come and build out a fintech company. So that's kind of where I'm from and how we got to today. That's awesome. So let's start with Divi. What, what is it? Can you ex describe it for listeners? <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Divi is a financial platform that allows companies to automate expense reports and make payments. So we, we do a lot of different things in those areas, but that's the genesis is that we were building out the financial platform that allows companies to only use one tool. And Divi is a free platform. So if you think about Expensify or Concur or some of those other types of things, Divi is a, a free replacement for those. We are a credit card. So we actually do payments and fulfillments and give lines of credit and those types of things. So Divi is a, a B2B payments and expense management platform. What was the impetus to found a payment slash expense management company? It's actually a fascinating story. So Blake Murray's the CEO and co-founder, and he was trying to, he never had cash and he was trying to figure out how he could allow his kids to spend money. They, they were so young, they didn't have bank accounts. They didn't have Venmo or anything like that. And he's trying to figure out, well, how can I send my kids money? Why can't I just have a card that I can essentially send funds to, right? And so as him and Alex Bean, our other co-founder, talked about the idea, they're like, well, what if we can do that for businesses? What if we can allow every employee in a company to have a card and then only give them access to the funds they need when they need them and, and some of those ideas? And they're like, okay, well, if we do that, then we can actually automate the expense reporting process. Okay, that's cool. Okay, if we do that, and, and you just started to build out this pretty amazing idea of how businesses and employees interact and spend money. Gotcha, gotcha. That is fascinating that it started with his, his kids or the notion of his kids trying it to- It literally started with them, him wanting to give his kids money to get ice cream. So it's, it's very, very funny. Well, they, they talk about designing for dead simple. Uh, <laughs> it's simple issues or challenges. I don't think it could get much simpler than that. So that's the so simplest hilarious. child. Is it? Yeah, we should lean into that a little more. Yeah, for sure, for sure. Well, you guys are on a tear and growing quite a bit. When you acquire a customer, are they usually coming to you to solve that expense management issue, or does it start with 
kind of the payment side of the equation? I'm just trying to where they start the journey. It's a good question. The answer is both. There are people who are saying, okay, I'm starting out. I'm a, I'm a funded startup and I need to go get a credit card and start making payments. But the healthy majority come because they're solving a software problem. They're saying, hey, expense fire concurred. That's a reactive thing where I'm reconciling and issuing reimbursements. And it's, it's not ideal. It's also expensive and cumbersome. So most people are trying to simplify and upgrade their expense management stack. And then they get into Divi and we do budgets, we do forecasting, we do a lot of other tools that help those companies. But yeah, the primary hook is either a company starting out and needing a credit card or a company who's trying to deal with managing their expenses. Got it. Okay. And you said it's free. So most services, like you talked about Concur and Expensify, those other expense reporting tools, if you will, they charge a per user fee. I'm assuming that you guys are making your money on the, the credit side and the transaction fees that you get to reap. Yep, that's right. So it's the interchange that is generated from the transaction fees. So to, to use the software, you're using the Divi credit card, the Divi MasterCard. And so when you swipe that card, we get a percentage of the interchange that always occurs. But one question people ask is like, well, are you, does that mean that the merchant has to pay more or do I get hurt in some way? And like, nope, most people just don't think about interchange ever and they shouldn't. And that's how Divi makes it money. Yeah. And it, it's a small percentage that's, that's floating around. So I guess it's ripe for FinTech that can design an efficient process. So that's cool. Yeah. Yep. That's exactly right. So your position is uh, head of revenue or senior vice president of revenue. Talk to me about what you're responsible for. Yeah. So the way that we designed revenue at Divi is a little, little different in, in sort of the way that I think the industry is going. But we encompass marketing, sales, and customer success under our revenue funnel. So that's all one umbrella with that focus. And, and that's my role at Divi is working with those teams. Okay. That's the entire customer journey. <laughs> it sure is. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> But that's the thing is that having that all in one place, you get to you get to manage that journey and those handoffs and that flow in in a really cool way that allows for a very nice customer experience. And so that was our thesis early on, and it's proven to be a winner for us. Do you feel like it's it's natural to have that largest scope, or how do you think about it? Yeah, so it's it's not common, right? A lot of times you have a CMO and a, and a you know head of sales and, and you have a bunch of different people who are responsible for those things. It's becoming more common to have a head of revenue like I just described. It is a large scope and you have to make sure that the team is just phenomenal, which luckily at Divi is very much the case. But I do think that having that person who is singularly responsible for revenue and the experience and the journey from top to bottom is going to going to continue to pick up steam. I think right before you became the, the head of revenue with this greater role and, and um, larger scope, if you will, you were head of marketing. And I'm curious because you mentioned you have, you studied finance. What was the impetus to go into the marketing realm? Yeah. So getting into finance a little bit, I, I just wasn't, it wasn't as fun to me as sort of the revenue generating activities of a business. And I, I had started a marketing agency when I was young. I was probably 15 or 16 years old when I started that agency. And I still have clients that I work with today from, from that early, that early endeavor. I decided that the finance acumen was great, but that I wanted to I wanted to be part of the revenue generating side of a business. And so I started in marketing. That was my role at Jive. That was my first role at Divi. And then built out those other functions as well. So kind of took on that skill set in, in between. Got it. Got it. Well, and so you still have marketing day among all those other things we talked about. What does your marketing look like? And kind of what's, what's your go-to or your best strategies or tactics, if you will? So we've got the team essentially broken up into four pillars. We've got demand generation, which is a very performance marketing focused sort of team. Then we've got our content and creative, right? Then we have our brand team, and then we have our partner acquisition team. And that's how it's broken up for us today. And then you asked, you know, what are, what are some of our, our go-tos? You know, particularly early on, we got really good at like sponsored content. We actually helped some, 
some of the newsletters that you see today, like The Hustle, Morning Brew, Owl, or some of those, we actually helped pioneer with some of them, their programs. You know, with some of them, we were their very first advertising dollars. And so we got really good at being able to kind of give a business update that didn't feel like an ad and putting our ad dollars to work. And back in those early days, we do some of those things and we get 600, 700, 800 demo requests in a day and just just destroy the sales team with uh, inbound interest. And so those are, and, and those things still perform at a high clip for us today. We've obviously diversified across, you know, podcasts and different things like that. But in addition to the performance marketing you normally see, we, we like content a lot. We like sponsored content a lot. That's really, really cool. And uh, Morning Brew, I love. I I, uh, I I give them a little shout out now because I read them every single morning uh, and they're hilarious, but also unbelievably informative about what's going on in the markets. They're awesome. Yep. And I mean, they're great because they're Divi customers and we advertise with them. So they get, they get like a double bonus. That's a double bonus. Yeah, that's a win, win, win. Yeah, that's awesome. That's awesome. Well, uh, how do you think about, I mean, you talked about this sponsored content as one. In the natural scheme of things, you would think of that as almost like an awareness or a brand building play. And then you talked about performance as well. How do you advise other peers in this like either SaaS business model or high growth marketers in terms of how to think about marketing? I think what you're starting out with is a fundamental question of where does my buyer consume content? And you have to know that if you're going to say, well, LinkedIn, Facebook, Google, that you're basically saying, duh, and I'm going to be competing with everyone else as well. So ask yourself, where can I find my buyer in a space that isn't that crowded? or in a space that isn't that saturated. And you can find these high efficiency, low cost channels that really allow for quick and efficient growth. And particularly when you're starting out, that's one of the most important things. So think about a super simple framework. What is my, what is my cheapest CPM? So where am I going to reach the most of, of my buyers for the least amount of money? And what is the strongest offer that I can go give to them? And so for us in the early days, we were saying, we'll give you a hundred bucks for a demo. And the math works for us with our conversion rates and, and what we're closing and how much money we're making, like it all, it all pencils. And so I would go find the cheapest CPM that gave me big reach. And I would go with a powerful offer. I think that if marketers, if you're not, if your offer doesn't make your finance team a little nervous, you probably need to go a little harder on your offer. But if you pair those things together independent of your market, you can have some special results. Gotcha. Yeah, no, it makes makes a lot of sense. So as you guys have, how long has Divi been around? I don't actually, I don't, I don't know when you guys were founded. So founded in 2016. And then we started, uh, you know, marketing and sales when, when I joined up in 2018. Okay. So you've been, you've been at it two years roughly. And have you had to diversify yet, you know, in terms of the types of tactics that you are deploying? Just curious how, how you've layered on things. Yeah, I mean, because if, if you stay, if you don't diversify, you're going to start getting diminishing returns. And if you don't get ahead of that, that can really, really hinder your growth and, and make for some unpleasant realities. So, yeah, I mean, basically, as soon as you find things that work, you're trying to find the next things that work and you never stop until you're incredibly, well, you never stop is the answer, but you just keep getting more and more diverse. Gotcha. Are there companies that you look to for inspiration as it relates to like where I should go next or, or a peer set that you turn to? Just curious kind of how you fuel your own ideas, if you will. Yeah. I mean, I, I look at and admire a lot of different companies. Some of the ones that I admire most are like HubSpot. Salesforce, some of these CRM plays, I just think are brilliant. When you talk about in sort of the, the fintech area, you look at what groups like Square and PayPal have done. And I, any stuff like that, I think you can draw inspiration from pretty easily. It makes sense. Well, I know one of the, another area that you're passionate about when we last spoke was how people, everyday employees, if you will, can use, should, and, and can use their personal brands to benefit both themselves and the organizations that they work for. I guess, first of all, why do you feel this is important? This is one that I've gotten pretty passionate about over the last little bit. I think people underestimate how much impact they can have on their own careers and on the companies they work for. 
if they take a little bit to put together a content strategy for themselves, for their personal brand. I think that you kind of look at other people as influencers and you don't really think of yourself as one, but at the end of the day, you do have great insights. You do have content that you can create and put out there that benefits you personally. But if someone's like someone's listening to this podcast, listening to Sterling Snow, it obviously helps my personal brand, but they're also learning about Divi. They also now know where they can go to automate their expense reports, to get a credit card, things like that. And so that two-edged sword is ridiculously powerful. And every single employee should have a LinkedIn presence, should have a Twitter presence, should be doing more to make themselves attractive from a career development perspective, but also to benefit the companies that they work at. What do you feel like is the best way to engage in that? Build your personal brand as well as highlight the company. The first thing is just start. Everyone, you feel like an idiot. You feel like no one's going to care or engage with your content. And that's really what gets a lot of people hung up. First thing you got to do is just get over that and then put together a very simple content strategy that you can actually follow. So as I talk to people about this inside and outside of Divi, I kind of walk them through like, give me three bullet points. You're going to post twice a week and you are going to post about, so say you're a a customer success man, you're going to post about what you're learning, best practices as a CSM. And you're going to do that twice a week. And here are some tips and tricks to do that effectively so that it's not just you putting out content into the ethos that's never going to get consumed by anyone. And there, there are different tricks around how to make that happen. One of the best ones is making sure that you tag other people. Like if I'm a CSM and I'm telling you something I learned, I should absolutely be tagging that customer that helped me learn it. I should actually absolutely be tagging that person who helped me learn it. Some of those different things help help get some more engagement. But really, it's that simple. Get over the fear of not starting and develop a, a simple strategy and then be consistent for a long time. And if you do that, you'll have success in building a personal brand. That's really good advice. I mean, I've... Um... I've tried to help a, a number of executives over the years do something similar, right? And and it is this like that impetus of getting over the urge of just starting. And it doesn't, the thing I used to advise them is, you know, spend 20, 30 minutes in the morning or whatever time works for you and just write your thoughts down, right? Right. Just for yourself, even just to get into the habit of writing. You'd be surprised too. I don't know if you feel this way, but I was surprised at how doing that actually helped me become a better communicator in general, like to everybody, not just in business. Oh yeah, it has far reaching effects. The other thing that I that I noticed, if you have those those thoughts or those insights, those moments of clarity, even if you're not ready to post about it or talk about it yet, make a note of it. It's what you're saying is write it down so that when you do think, well, I should probably post on LinkedIn, you've got an idea. You don't have to just generate something on the spot. No, that's good. That's really good advice. Well, one of the things I I do love to do, um, besides talk about, you know, your business, Divi, um, and your marketing experience and what's working for you is also to get to know you, the person, a little bit more. And I love asking this question, which is, you know, has there been an experience of your past that defines and makes up who you are today? (laughs) Yeah, it's a great question. I I spend a lot of time thinking about what the defining moments are that make me me. Well, I'll tell you a sad story. This is one of my defining moments. I played basketball in, in high school. I really loved it. I spent a lot of time trying to become the best basketball player that I could be. And I really only had one goal. And that goal was to win a state championship. That was my basketball aspiration. So my junior year we we go on you know 22 game win streak or something like that end up winning all of our playoff games getting into the state championship game and we end up losing and that, that sucked I mean I remember crying in the locker room not not wanting to come out and looking making myself look in the mirror in that locker room and saying hey you've got one more year to achieve this goal and you're going to work harder you're going to be better you're going to be smarter all these things to come back and, and win so senior year starts playing basketball. We actually have a, we have a fantastic team. We're winning all these games. We win again all through the playoffs. Get to get to the state championship game. We're up by I think fourteen at halftime. I'm literally thinking to myself, okay, this is close. How do I want to celebrate when we win this thing? And we ended up losing again. And it seems trivial, right? It's high school sports. You move on. It's not a big deal. But I think about that event most days. I think about what I'm supposed to learn from it. I'm supposed to learn 
the bitter disappointment of failure and how how to not deal with that again in in my life. Now I I care a lot about business now and, and fast growing tech is a is a game is a sport and I try to think about all those lessons all the things I could have done differently, all the different ways I could have prepared. And I think that's defined me in a lot of ways as far as that extreme desire to win was fostered by the thought that I can never go win a state championship as a high school basketball player. So it, it, it's it's funny, but I think that's made me me in a lot of ways. It's made me competitive. It's made me aware. It's made me a hard worker. It's made me a lot of the characteristics that I hopefully have today. I could see, so I'm going to play a little armchair psychologist. I could see an element of, you know, now that experience making you never take your foot off the gas, <laughs> never just constantly keep pushing. Do you find yourself doing that? And and if you do, how do you know when to take a break? <laughs> yeah, I I do spend a lot of time and energy foot on the gas, right? I I think I owe it to to the team, I owe it to my boss, I owe it to myself. Some of those kinds of things are are quite deep because of that event. So yeah, how do you know how to balance that with self care and not in managing your own burnout and things like that? And to me, I things that are really important are exercise and family time. And if I get kind of my quota of exercise and family time, I can basically keep my foot. This, this is just for me. It doesn't, this is a different formula for everyone else. But if I get those things, I can, I can keep my foot on the gas and I don't feel the the burnout or the diminishing returns that, that you normally get. No, that's awesome. That's awesome. Well, you're a relatively young guy. I'm old, so I can say that. But <laughs> what advice would you give yourself if you were starting all over again? Yeah, thought about this one a lot too. I think I would go back and try to reinstill a sense of urgency because early on in your career, the decisions you make, the way that you progress, it has exponential returns. So it's like it's like investing, right? If you invest money in your 20s, it ends up being a whole lot different when you're 60 than if you invest it when you're 40. And you also have some flexibility and some time you you don't have you know your family situation's different you're usually single you're usually x y or z and if you're willing to just buckle down and really you can get exponential returns on your career i would reinstill that in myself i would also tell myself you pick mentors and you pick companies and that's basically it and if you pick those things well and work very hard and do the best you can, you'll be successful. Those are a, a few of the key points that I'd, I'd tell young Sterling. <laughs> I love it. You know, are there brands or companies that you follow or, or causes even um, you think other people should take notice of? So a company that's just a fascinating case study for me on almost every front is Qualtrics. They're out in Utah. They got bought by SAP, you know, two years ago for like $9 billion after most people hadn't really heard of them. What they did from a, a marketing sales software category perspective, just amazing. And I, I oftentimes revert back to them and some of the decisions that they made. And I think that's, that's pretty cool. And there, there are other just exceptional companies. I look at like into it. I look at Credit Karma. So I'm in the fintech space a little bit. And those ugh, those companies are just special. What they build, how they go to market, how they use channel, how they do acquisition. It's just those are three that I'd point out for people to go double click on. No, that's great. And I, I, Qualtrics is a great one, especially given your role and scope, because they're you know, having been a Qualtrics customer in the past. Um, you know, they're great at customer service and just the onboarding experience as well. So. Now, there's very little that Qualtrics doesn't do exceptionally well. So Yeah, yeah, no, I agree. So I'm having a little fun with this new, this is a new question for me. I think other podcasters have used it, but I'm just curious if, you know, what's been the most impactful purchase of $100 or less in the last six to 12 months? <laughs> the most impactful purchase under 100 bucks last six months. Well, you know, I'll, I'll be honest. I'll level with you here, Alan. Um, it's been it's been Corona prepping time, right? And there's been you know a little a little bit of weirdness. So one thing that I went out and bought was a hundred bucks or less was a a big water tank. So, and again, it makes no sense. I know it's completely illogical. A pandemic does not shut off your water main. Like it, it 
so illogical, but it just made me feel more prepared for, I don't know, the apocalypse. And uh, so I, 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 I'd go with that, a big a big drum of fresh water that I can drink out of. I love that. I love that. It, it's mental health. It's mental health. Yeah, you know. trying to find peace out here, you know? <laughs> exactly. Exactly. Well, last question for you. What do you feel is either, and you can go either direction here, what do you feel is the largest opportunity or the biggest threat for marketers today? Oh, I think the biggest threat is a lack of creativity. It's also the biggest opportunity. It's the same thing. I think people aren't, marketers in particular, aren't challenging themselves enough with completely new thoughts and ideas. And normally when you see someone do something special, they did it for like the first or second time. Listen, everyone's doing PPC, okay? Everyone's doing paid social. So tell me as a marketer what you are doing that is ridiculously creative. And I think that's a big drawback. One other thing I'd add, I think that if marketers aren't revenue focused, so don't talk to me about MQLs, don't talk to me about metrics that don't matter. Talk to me deep in the funnel. What are you doing as a marketer that makes you essential to your business? And I think those are two areas of caution and opportunity for all of us as marketers. Awesome. Well, Sterling, thank you so much for coming on the show. It's been fascinating. Yeah, thanks for having me on. I really appreciate it. Hi, it's Alan again. Marketing Today was created and produced by me. If you're new to Marketing Today, please feel free to write us a review on iTunes or your favorite listening platform. Don't forget to subscribe and tell your friends and colleagues about the show. I love to hear from listeners, and you can contact me at marketingtodaypodcast.com. There you'll also find complete show notes with links to anything we talk about on any episode. You can also search our archives. I'm Alan Hart, and this is Marketing Today.